Coming up on this episode, we talk to Adam Silvera about his brand new book, Infinity Reaper. Welcome to episode 291 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. I'm Will Knauss, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Mr. Jeff Adams. Hello, everybody. Welcome back, Rainbow Romance readers. We are so glad that you can join us for another episode of the show. It is officially March, and you know what that means. We've got an announcement. I'm very pleased to announce that the March Big Gay Fiction Book Club selection is going to be in our Walker's Throwing Hearts. It's certainly the cutest thing I've read in a long time, possibly ever. I agree. It was so freaking adorable. I loved it so, so much, and I'm excited to get to talk to you about it. Pottery, crotchety seniors, and lots and lots of sweet romance. Now, members of our Patreon community will get a sneak preview of this episode coming up this week. And it will become available to everyone else in the regular podcast feed on Thursday, March 25th. Make sure you pick up Throwing Hearts if you haven't read it yet. You will not regret it. Want to let everybody know that Rainbow Space Magic, which is an online LGBTQ plus science fiction and fantasy convention, is back for a second year the weekend of March 12th through the 14th. Among the events are a keynote address from author Jewel Gomez, who wrote the first black lesbian vampire novel, The Gilda Stories. And that was a winner of two 1991 Lambda Literary Awards. You can find the complete schedule, author list, and registration information at rainbowspacemagic.org. And if you want to hear more from the organizers, you can catch the interview we did with J. Scott Coatsworth and Angel Martinez last year for the debut of this con, and then you can find that in episode 245. And in another little tidbit of news that we'd like to share, this past week, Frolic Media featured an article we wrote on 11 black authors writing incredible LGBTQ plus stories who've appeared on our show. The article showcased Zio Axelrod, Jace Ellis, Riley Hart, Adriana Herrera, Frederick Smith and Chaz Lamar, Laquette, Joe Aquonco, Christina Tomlinson, A.E. Vi, and Julian Winters. We think that these are all authors who should be on your TBR, and we'll have a link to the article on our show notes page so that you can learn more about these amazing authors. We also made our first appearance on Clubhouse this week. I was in a conversation with Frolic Sarah Pinna, and we had a conversation about our five favorite LGBTQ romance novels. Now, it would be no surprise that I highlighted stuff from my always go-tos. I talked about Serena Bowen, TJ Klune, Lucy Lennox, Adriana Herrera, and Casey McQuiston. It was a wonderful conversation, and really the first time I've dug into Clubhouse. And if you don't know what Clubhouse is, it is this new, everybody's sort of talking about it, social media platform that is all about audio. People can come in, have panel discussions. You can raise your hand, come up on the stage, say a few things. It's a really interesting place. If you're on Clubhouse, make sure to follow me at Big Gay Fiction. And I also want to recommend if you're there, check out the Diverse Shelves Club, where they really are working to amplify books by BIPOC and LGBTQ authors and Basically, they're trying to amplify all of own voices, and it's a really interesting place where they're always talking about books that you probably want to add to your TBR. So check that out, and keep an eye on our social channels for more stuff that we'll be doing on Clubhouse in the future. And one last bit of personal news before we get to this week's author interview. Jeff and I are still taking part in the 100-day project, and if you're listening to this on the day that it goes live, we have just hit day 30. Woohoo! Yeah, yes. One third of the way through. So in terms of progress, I feel pretty good about everything that I've been doing. My attempt to draw 100 hearts in 100 days and post those online is still going strong. My attempt to read 100 stories in 100 days and write reviews and share my thoughts on those stories on my various social media channels, that's still going strong as well. Although I was talking with Jeff just the other day and I'm starting to feel a tad bit burnt out. Because in addition to this 100-day project, I'm also still reading full-length work to be reviewed here on the show. And it's starting to get to be a lot. (laughs) Not that I'm not enjoying it. I will always love gay fiction. But you know that old saying, you can never have too much of a good thing? I think I'm starting to reach the, like, upper threshold of what I'm capable of consuming. So we'll see how that goes for the rest of the 100 days, but still going pretty well. Also, Jeff and I have been working on our diet since we started the challenge on January 31st. We've been watching what we've been eating, plus doing some intermittent fasting. And in the first 30 days, I've dropped 15 pounds, and Jeff has dropped close to 20. Yeah, it's been really good getting into a healthier eating habit. And 
I'm dealing with intermittent fasting far better than I thought I would. I wasn't sure I could go for such a long span of time, like especially in the morning before I got to breakfast. But so far, so good there. As I've said before on the show, and I will say it again through the rest of the 100 days, I am sure your heart drawings absolutely delight me. Every single morning, this new heart gets produced, and I'm just like, oh, so cute. I've also been working on writing every single day in this 100 days. My plan is to always write at least 30 minutes. Most days I'm writing more than that and actively working on a, a short story that will get published later this year. So, yeah, so far so good on the 100-day project as we hit day 30. Now, I have to say it was such a thrill for me to talk to this week's guest, Adam Silvera. I love what I do on the podcast. I get to talk to so many amazing authors, but then there are these moments where I talk to an author who is like a major influence on my writing specifically. And in Adam's case, it's especially the writing that I do for my young adult stories. A few episodes back, I actually reviewed Infinity Sun to be ready for Infinity Reaper that comes out this week. Adam talks about creating the world in this series and what readers can expect with the new book. He also shares a little bit about another project he's got coming out this year, which is the sequel to What If It's Us, the book that he co-wrote a few years ago with Becky Albertalli. This interview is packed with such good stuff, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Adam, welcome to the podcast. It is so wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to talk about everything. And, and a lot of that everything involves the second book in the Infinity Cycle that comes out this week. It's called Infinity Reaper. But before we get yes. to that, let's set the stage a little bit for folks who have not read this series yet with the first book, Infinity Sun. Tell us about this story and the brothers, Emil and Brighton. Absolutely. So Infinity Sun is my fifth book that I published, but it is my first fantasy novel. And it takes place in an alternate New York where magic is real. They, you know, people who have powers are called celestials and people who steal powers from mythical creatures such as phoenixes and basilisks. They're known as specters. And the brothers Emil and Brighton have grown up in this world. So you get to see sort of magic play out from like social media angles as well. And you have Brighton who is like big social media head, like he loves Instagram and YouTube and has his own channel and like aspires for like fame. And then Emil is our like kind of like softer brother who like works at the museum gift shop and yeah, and it explores what happens when Emil finds himself with the powers of a special kind of Phoenix and Brighton doesn't. So it really creates this really fun dynamic where Emil has powers he doesn't want, and Brighton is just like obsessed over Emil's powers and like wants them for himself. The, the dynamic between them was so interesting between being on, you know, essentially equal footing and then ending yeah. up with like getting exactly what one didn't want and the other one didn't get it at all. Yeah. Was that as fun to play with as I think it would be? It, it was. And it's really interesting, too, because I originally didn't design this story to be a brotherhood story. You know, like I, Emil was like my main character. And then I had really loved the name Brighton, but I had kind of intended that to be for Emil's love interest. And then while writing the first sentence of the book, Emil says something like my brother Brighton. And I'm like, your brother, like I have a whole outline that does not include a brother, like, where is this coming from? But I followed it and I was like, oh, this is a really interesting dynamic. I have an older brother, he's two years older and uh, Emil and Brighton are twins. But yeah, I had so much fun, you know, with like Emil being this chosen one who really doesn't want to be chosen. He's not excited to be the hero. His anxiety is really like spiraling because of it. And then Brighton just sort of like finding himself in his brother's shadow for the first time, even though he's been the overachiever his entire life and just getting like more and more envious as the book progresses. Yeah. And that's putting it lightly on getting more and yeah. more envious. One of the things I like so much about the way that you structured this book to get us integrated into it, your lead in is kind of like the classic disaster movie setup, where it's like, you see the universe, you meet all of these characters, you kind of see their normalcy before everything pivots. Yeah. <laughs> and I love how, how much normalcy you gave us, not just with the characters, but with the world you created. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, I know like, what people don't like the most about the book, I would say, is when, because I don't stop and explain every single new magical term, basically. But 
that didn't feel organic for me because Emil and Brighton have lived in this world, right? You know, it's, and it's like told from their perspective. So they're not going to like stop and explain everything that is, that they've grown up knowing, you know, I think so much about a lot of my favorite books growing up, including like Harry Potter or City of Bones, where the characters were new to those worlds. So we got, as the reader, we got to learn things as the characters were learning them, right? Like that was such an easy way to do it. But when you've grown up with like phoenixes being creatures already, like you're not going to stop and like take eight paragraphs to explain what a a phoenix is in the same way that no one ever stops to explain what a pigeon is in New York, you know, (laughs) because like you do that and then it starts othering your world, you know? And I'm like, no, like this is, it's contemporary for them. This is nothing, it's special, but not really. And yeah, so it was always my goal to just make it feel like I was true to the character's voices. So I don't know, it's sometimes it can be a lot to take in, but you know, readers are smart. Like you, you pick up on it and you, you catch on. And that's one of the things, another of the many things that I liked is because you didn't take the moment to take the info dump. It's like, okay, there's Phoenix powers. These are the celestials. This is this. And I just took it in as I went and I wasn't like, wait, what? You know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's about giving the reader what they actually need. And I promise you, like everyone, there've been a lot of people who were like, I want to know who the first celestial was. I'm like, do you know who the first witch or wizard was in Harry Potter? Like you don't, you, you do not. Like we never got that information and you were fine. Like I promise you it's going to be okay. I know it's like a love for the world as well, where you just, you want more of it. Like I've been that reader. Like I want to know who the first mutant was and stuff like that. I mean, I guess we do know that like apocalypse, but just like brain times to other fandoms or whatever, you really like you, when you love something, you love it, right. you know, but I, for me, it just like, it wasn't important to share that information. And there were actually a lot of things that were included in the book. And my editor and I had numerous conversations about what do we actually want to keep here? Because when you start including all these like details about your fantasy world, you're asking your reader to commit them to memory because maybe it's going to be important (laughs) um, in that book. And then when you, so if, if I give you like 20 new terms or whatever, but only four are integral to the main central plot of this installment, then you're going to be so distracted. You're going to be like, well, what happened to that magical ring that we learned about in chapter seven? Or where's the, I don't have magical rings in my book. Just a random (laughs) example. And, but you start paying attention to these things and it's like, oh, I guess that was just a cool little detail, you know? And I had tons of cool little details in in the book that could have been more fun for some people, but I want to arm you with what you need for the story. And I think like there are a couple instances with Infinity Sun, especially where there are some sentences that are going to appear kind of like throwaway and they're huge in book two, (laughs) you know, but it wasn't necessary for you to have all the information yet. So I felt like I'll just hold on to it until it's actually more in your face. As the reader, I also like that because I mean, it's like what you can run into when you're writing a mystery. If you point out too many things that are the red herrings, it becomes like, oh my God, what what's going on? A hundred percent. Yeah. And I've always feel that way when reading thrillers, I'm like, okay. And then, you know, it starts feeling really dizzy and, you know, like I do think great thrillers like do know how to like, throw you off like their send a little bit but sometimes you play your hand like too heavily and I'm like I don't want to do that I want the fiction to feel true to the characters whether it's a fantasy world or a contemporary world like I that perspective I'm in that's where I give the most thought to it's not how can I make this like easier for the reader maybe that's my failure as an author but like (laughs) as an artist like that is how I like work through my books Infinity Sun was a giant shift for you after four contemporary young adult books, and now you're over in urban fantasy. What was it like for you to kind of take that leap and create a lot of your own world? I mean, I loved, as a former New Yorker, how many New York reference points I got in alternate New York, but still, big leap. You had a lot of stuff to create here. Yeah, I mean, I had, so what's really funny for me is that I got into writing when I was 11 and I was writing fantasy stories. So for me to have published like so many more like realistic novels was, that was more jarring for me than the fact that I was transitioning to becoming like a fantasy author, published fantasy author at book five. Like for me, this was like, this was coming home in a lot of ways. Like my writing roots are a hundred percent 
in fantasy <laughs> and uh, in the shows I watched and the video games I played in the books I read and the movies I watched, you know, it's like, it has always been fantasy. Like, I mean, I, I would, I had comic books that I was drawing, you know, like of me and like magical situations and friends in magical situations. And that was like my true joy. And what was more of a challenge was sort of finding my own voice in fantasy, just because a lot of my early fantasy writing experiences were rooted in fan fiction, which I always recommend for aspiring authors and emerging writers, just because it gives you this opportunity to just focus on like the craft of writing or in the joy of it without having to like create your own magical system or characters from scratch or whatever. Like you have your templates and now just go have fun and go write, you know, and see if you can like commit to it. And, but now it wasn't doing fan fiction. I was like doing my, creating my own world. And like, that was definitely a challenge. And I wanted to play homages to some of my favorite stories growing up, which of course included X-Men and Harry Potter and Supernatural and Charmed. And like, those were really formative stories for me growing up but it's like yeah but what does an Adam Silvera novel look like I'm like well it looks a lot queerer than all those other stories so you have a gay chosen one you have a bisexual shapeshifter you have a bisexual vigilante like I mean and and tons of other like queer presences throughout the novel as well I often tell people I'm like if you want an x-men to be just like a little bit gayer like check out (laughs) infinity sun you know that's the perfect tagline (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, if you, and because I mean, X Men is like it's queer like throughout the comics, you know. But like, you're not seeing that in like the mainstream movies at, at at present. I just wanted to like serve that side of me and just sort of write a fantasy novel that I think I would have absolutely obsessed over more than ten years ago. And I love that it's queer without queer being the most important thing about any of these people. Nope. It's no one's coming out, which, you know, those stories are all valid, um, but it is not what I needed for this book, you know, and I've told my coming out stories too, and maybe I'll tell more, but I, I, I know for sure that I'll tell more. I have an idea that I'm really excited about, but I, in this space, I'm like, no, I just like, I want them to be out and cool and accepted and definitely recognizing what it means to be a queer person in the world and sort of like the prejudices that we can encounter, but for the most part, like all the real danger comes from the magical war that they're participating in. Mm -hmm. And I guess the flip my question around the original question I just asked, all that fantasy, how did you end up writing contemporaries for your first novels? (laughs) Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, I, I think writing has always been therapeutic for me and especially like within the past 11, 12 years or so, And like, I just recently started like going to like therapy consistently in the past like year, you know, and it's like completely changed my life. Before that, like writing was my therapy. I tell everyone writing was therapy before therapy. And that's how I just was able to sort through my feelings about everything I've been through, my traumas, my history, the things I wanted for myself, my fears, especially my books are tend to always be generated by a, a, a fear of mine. And I was going through a lot of stuff in my early 20s and I needed to write about it. And the story originally was designed to be this like big dystopian trilogy. And then this is my first novel, More Happy Than Not, which is right now in its published form is about a 16 year old boy named Aaron Soto who wants to forget that he's gay through a memory alteration procedure. But before that, the idea was like much bigger. It was about like bounty hunters who were previously gay and then they had their minds wiped and now they became bounty hunters to track down other gay people and completely different story. It also bored me writing it within chapter one to the point where I like killed off the main character. (laughs) Like genuinely, I was like, oh, this not it for me and then I read an adult novel The Postmortals by Drew McGorry and it's a standalone novel that takes place in a world where death they have like a an injection that like prevents you from dying of like of old age of of aging completely Mm. so you can get the shot at like three months and you'll be three months for the rest of your life or whatever you know and so yeah so it just like it was really interesting I was like oh my god if this had been like the YA novel especially when like dystopian was really big this would have been a trilogy for sure and I really admired how the story had such a grounded approach and was able to tell it within a like single volume that inspired me to do the same with my book. And I just loved being able to write about the Bronx with just like a slight hook of speculative fiction attached to it that, you know, keeps the book shelved in contemporary realistic sections, even though there's a small sci-fi element to it. And I think that's true for a lot of my books. And certainly 
the characters that you got here in Infinity Sun, I mean, it's certainly in the tradition of the characters that you've created in all the books. They're very strong teenagers, you know, kind of figuring themselves out. There's a lot of messiness involved with that. Were those characters more difficult to find their balance in this grander stage of the magical war that's happening? Yes and no. You know, it's so tricky because I went back and forth numerous times on how I was going to tell this story. I'm like, is it just Emil's perspective? I was like, okay, maybe it's just Emil and Brighton, the brothers. And then I was like, okay, but, you know, they're both so close. And yes, they do have, like, varying perspectives, especially for, like, twins. But I wanted someone who was more sort of, like, grown up within the world, you know, and with power. So that's where Maribel Lucero comes from. And you know, like she's the daughter of kind of like the, of the Spellwalkers who are basically our X-Men of the novel in short. And uh, she's kind of grown up in that spotlight as well. And I'm like, okay, I, we now have the perspective of someone who has grown up with powers versus Emil who gets them in very early on in the um, Infinity Sun. And then I, you know, she's a celestial, which means she was born with powers. And then I wanted the perspective of someone who is a specter, aka they got their powers from the blood of a creature. And I'm like, okay, what does it take for you to make that leap and make that choice, you know? And that's where Nessa Royal came from. And at one point I cut Nessa out of the book and then wrote him back in like a week before the advanced copies went to print. It was so wild. Like I'm so glad you wrote him back in because he is one of my favorites. And he's kind of, he's the fan favorite of the series. And it's so interesting because everyone loves him so much and he has I think the fewest amount of chapters, his chapters are so short because I had to protect a lot about his identity in that novel for a a few reasons. And which is one of the reasons I had written him out at one point where I'm like, oh, how can I like dance around this? And I just figured it out, you know? But yeah, he has like significantly more chapters in Infinity Reaper. It's like very balanced now. I, I loved figuring out how I could use each character's perspective to just sort of better help the reader settle into the war at hand and different stakes and and just their own personal feelings to it, you know? But Mm -hmm. writing a book with four narrators is very challenging and I hope I never do it again. (laughs) (laughs) As the reader though, I really liked it when it became clear that we were gonna go into other heads other than just Brighton and Emil too, because yeah. just to open it up that little bit yeah. was really interesting and added a nice depth, I thought. I am so happy that it worked for you. I am never doing it again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like outside of this series, I, I swear, like I'm already like, I don't even want to do two narrator novels anymore. Cause I'm just like, I feel like I need a break. I feel like I just want to stay in one mm. character. But <laughs> All, all the stories I keep conceiving, they're, they're multiple narrators, and I'm sure others, a third is going to sneak in, and then a fourth, and then a fifth. I'm going to be like, what is happening? I've lost control. You mentioned when you started outlining this that it was only Emil. There wasn't the idea of the brothers. What was your seat of inspiration for Emil and what his journey was going to become in this book? <laughs> Yeah, so it's really, really interesting because again, this book was originally, it's a young adult novel with like adult appeal, but like it was originally conceived as a dark fairy tale for the middle grade audience. Like it was called The Girl with Monster Blood and and there was going to be a character who was like the boy with Phoenix blood in it, you know? So there's a big ritual that happens in this book that was the complete central plot for this fairy tale thing. And like you learn about this essence called Reaper's blood and basically within infinity cycle. And that was like the main plot of this, this dark fairy tale for middle grade. And I, I just wanted to go darker with it in ways that I didn't feel quite comfortable introducing for children because I just didn't have like the range to understand yet, like what some readers are prepared for at that age. And I was building my career in YA and I was like, you know what, like I want to tell a YA story like this is when I it was in my YA years that I really really got into like fantasy and stuff too so but then it was a different narrator the narrator for YA originally was Maribel who is in the book and she's a central character but she's no longer like the main character the story doesn't revolve around her anymore but that plot completely changed and like at the time there were no spell walkers there were literally no heroes in this book they were it was just sort of like the gang of specters who had stolen their powers from creatures. And I 
kept working on it and the, the story just wasn't right. I was starting at the wrong place. Like you could kind of say that I was starting that book where book two in a series was kind of began. And then I realized that one of my favorite things about fantasy stories is when you get to see the hero get their powers for the first time. And that wasn't the case in this incarnation where Maribel was narrator. So then I started playing with it again. And I was like, you know what? Like, I want to see like a queer boy at the center of this, like kind of become the chosen one. And like, I want to see the kind of character that I could have been if I found myself in this situation, you know, which is why Emil's very anxious about it. Like you think that these characters are going to welcome these destinies and be like, oh, I have powers. This is cool. Emil's like, no, I'm only doing this because I'm gonna help you guys out. And in doing so, I might find out how to get rid of these powers for good. And I can like live my life, you know, like he is not trying to be doing this for the, the rest of his years. Like his happy ending is getting to expel these powers for himself, you know? So that's what he's working towards. And if he can like save some lives along the way, fantastic, you know? But the <laughs> moment he can do this, he's out. And they've agreed to that for him, you know? Ultimately, to answer your question, I wanted a queer boy as the chosen one and just like figuring out if that's what he actually wanted for himself if he would have made that choice if given and the answer is no but now what do you do with it regardless <laughs> and i loved hearing how much of a discovery writer you are where you've got this great outline but then it's like brighton becomes the brother boom <laughs> yeah and you're like i can do the easy thing and just stick to the outline or i can explore where that happened and now it's like all the marketing around this series is about the brotherhood and, you know, being at the center of this war. And I'm like, God, I can't imagine Brighton not being a character, mm -hmm. Brighton not being Emil's brother now. Right. So let's get into Infinity Reaper. You left people on such a cliff at the end of Infinity Sun. I mean, that was like, yes. whoa, I was glad I waited for basically a year to read it. So I have a much narrower time frame between the yeah. cliffhanger and the next book. What can you tell us about Infinity Reaper that doesn't give up too much? Yeah, it's everything that could go wrong goes wrong in Infinity Reaper. We have some characters who are making some very questionable choices. Um, and I think you do develop some understanding for why they're making these choices, but it can still be really absolutely maddening and frustrating. And you're going to want to shake some of the characters, especially Brighton. Brighton is, you know, he wants fame and glory and he doesn't like being overshadowed. And he wants to step into the spotlight and he's willing to kind of risk it all to do so. And you know, you'll have to read Reaper to see how that like works out for him. But I really do think that, you know, whether you were shocked or not at like what happens, uh, this is what I've been kind of like building towards. And that was always the ending for Infinity Sun. Like uh, once I knew that this was a story about the brothers and one having powers and the other one not. Yeah, it's, it gets really wild. And I, I, I'm so excited. I love Infinity Reaper. So I love Infinity Sun, but like Infinity Reaper, I got to do so many things that I've been dreaming about writing for years. And Ooh. yeah, like, I mean, there's like new Phoenix powers that are hinted at in book one, but people haven't really caught up on it being like a real thing just yet. And you see that it's real and it's really cool. And everyone who's read the book so far, they say that it's among their favorite passages and chapters. And I feel really fulfilled with what I was able to do with that so far. Oh. That just gets me all the more excited. I've only read the first chapter so far, and I totally get what you mean with Brighton. Because even in that first chapter, I'm like, Brighton, really? <laughs> yeah. and You want it that bad. <laughs> yeah. And give it a couple more chapters, and you'll see sort of his explanation behind that big choice that he's made. This is what I love about writing all these additional narrators. Like you really do have to get into their head, especially in first person perspectives. And I don't know if I would have come to this conclusion um, if I weren't writing Brighton's perspective, you know? I don't want to spoil too much, but really I, I, I think it, it was really to my greatest benefit that he's one of the narrators for the story, even though he pisses off so many readers. I'm like, He's supposed to, like, he well, is like yeah. not so, and, but for some people he's their favorite character. And I'm like, because Brighton speaks a lot of troops, whether we want mm -hmm. to say those troops out loud or not along to them, you know? And 
he just doesn't have a filter for these things. And it's, you know, I definitely share a lot of Brighton sentiments, not all of them, but, you know, thankfully I have like the ability to kind of like <laughs> exercise my like craft as a writer to kind of like dig deeper. And I'm like, you know, I, when I notice that I feel uncomfortable at a line sometimes, I'm like, I don't think Brighton would though. I think Brighton would say this thing. And Brighton is the character who says the quiet thing out loud for sure. <laughs> You're writing magic now and these different types of humans between the specters and the spellwalkers. You've got huge battle scenes. I swear every battle in Infinity Sun just kept ratcheting up the tension, the number of people involved. What kind of preparation did you take to work out those aspects so that it all makes sense and you know keeps driving the story forward without bogging it down? I, I try to picture it like a movie. I'm like, okay, what would be like really fun to like watch play out for sure. But I also want to pay actual attention to what I think it would be like to get hit by a fireball, you know, <laughs> or to be thrown across like a park and then like slammed into a tree. And I, I find myself saying like, it knocks the breath out of me a lot. It knocks the breath out of me a lot. I'm like, but it would knock the breath out of you a lot. At some point you start like tearing down those details because like, okay, cool, like I get it. But like, I'm like, what would it actually mean, you know, to find myself just like completely like rattled around in the dark? Like there's like a really, I think kind of like creepy scene in Infinity Reaper where there's basically a fight scene in the dark and only their opponent can see them and it puts them at like a gigantic disadvantage and they're already kind of weak from the fight. It happens very early on in the book. So they're still reeling from the final showdown from Infinity Sun and no one has their bearings together yet. Like it's really intense. And I remember the copy editor reading it and just being like, oh my God, that was so creepy. And like, I, I feel it again in my chest right now, even like talking about it. And I'm like, okay, well, what would that be like? And it's like, you have no sense of like movement. Like you can be thrown across the room and have no idea when you're about to hit impact with the wall or anything or whatever you're going to hit, right? And and then it's like, and then you're trying to like figure out like what's clattering and it's just, it can be really disorienting and ultimately disorienting. I love paying attention to bruises and cuts. And did I say like, oh, I felt like my arm was about to break and it's like, cool. So then you're gonna have arm pain for like, the rest of the book pretty much you know because these books take place and over the course of like weeks and everything too and I mean, if you can't heal then you can't heal you mm -hmm. know i think one of the challenges sometimes is that you want to make sure that none of the characters are so powerful that it seems like they can't lose the fight so i make a point to eliminate or like knock out the sort of like the most helpful player sometimes to like really put everyone in a more difficult predicament but you do that for, you know, even Emile and Brighton too. Sometimes they get the easy win because you kind of got to have a give me in there somewhere. But yeah, none of this is easy for them. No. And I like how it keeps coming back to have to be a hero and do the right thing and all of this. But then you flip back and you're 18 years old and you might just want to go curl up with mom. <laughs> Which is Emil often. Emil really is just yeah. like, I just want to be with my mom, you know? And like, but it's like, well, too bad. You're the chosen one. And again, he's not like an official chosen one, but that's how he's treated because of his, um, his past lives, um, which we learn about in Infinity Sun. And, and yeah, so like, that's really difficult for him. Like he wants to do the right thing, but he's also just wants to be a kid. Like he is a kid. And, you know, I'm so, I'm such a fan of so many YA novels and, like, I mean, let's use Katniss from the Hunger Games for an example or whatever. I'm like, I would never be Katniss. I would never be that brave. I would never be that effective. And, you know, Katniss, of course, is like traumatized by like everything that she has gone through. And she's gonna be traumatized for the rest of her life. And she succeeded in so many ways, but she's not gonna be able to shake mm -hmm. all that off. And that same could be said for all these characters here, because at the end of the day, I just remind myself that even though this is a fantasy world, these are human characters. Like, they are not 500-year-old wizards. Like, they can die. And we see a death in Infinity Sun. And there's more on the way throughout the rest of the series. And <laughs> I really hated you for the Infinity Sun death. A lot of people did. And like, I... <laughs> dude, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah, but also, and that's that death doesn't go um, ungrieved in right. Infinity Reaper. Like that is a big death. And I think sometimes, you know, in a lot of books I've read where I'm like, 
shouldn't we be missing this person? Wouldn't you be kind of, and it's like, no, like, and it really warps the character who has been affected by this character's death and by this other character's death. So like, I had different plans for this character in this book, like even a different ending at one point and it changed because the grief just never faded, you know? And I'm like, and I'm like, yeah, but that's honest. Like it, it, it just wouldn't, but I didn't know that from my outline because I wasn't, you know, when you're outlining, it's like, here are, I think the cool beats for the story. Here's what feels natural, whatever. And I'm like, no, you learn what's natural when you're like actually in the character's headspace and following their lead and not just forcing them into your engineered situations. How close did Infinity Sun or even Infinity Reaper stick to their outlines? Uh, Infinity Sun changed a lot. Infinity Reaper changed a lot. Like there are <laughs> new characters in Infinity Reaper that appeared literally zero times in the original draft. Between the draft I turned into my publisher and then what is final, whole new characters, whole new settings. The book is twice as long like it, it i mean that story really truly grew and i turned in a very rough draft which is also why it was like on the shorter side but it you know new characters came about that my editor really just trusted me he was like look i know you know what you're doing and i turned in a version of that book that looked was pretty unrecognizable from what was like first kind of like in i would say maybe like 30 40 percent like the essence of what was in the first draft probably stayed but everything like again one one of the characters endings like completely changed and i've now set up like an interesting challenge for myself for the next installment nice and speaking of next how many books do you project in the infinity cycle three traditional it's, trilogy <laughs> traditional trilogy it was always pitched as a trilogy book three will be out in 2022 but yeah i've always from what i planned out you know if i could have done a duology i would have the story was like it was too big you know i'm really excited to see how things come together for the finale like i already know where i want everyone to end up and i hope i'm able to honor it because i think it's really cool but also as we've talked about already, I'm open to seeing where the story goes and where the characters take me. I'm totally shipping for a meal. I'm not going to say who I'm shipping with because I'm not going to spoil anything, but I'm totally yeah. shipping a meal. But I hope you make that happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people are, and I'm excited for people's reaction slash a little nervous of when they read Infinity Reaper because some dynamics get shaken up a little bit on that front. There's a lot of queer love and slow burn attractions like growing within the series, but things definitely get really hot in, in Infinity Reaper. Yeah. So I remember I had one of my team members read it and she was like, I don't care about romance, but I love these two. And she was like, that was really hot. I was like, cool, great. You know, so really um, excited to like serve the queer community that way. I'm excited to see how you work it in because I, I, it's always tough with romantic suspense. And I mean, this isn't romantic suspense, but there's this whole other big thing going on and you find those tender moments where you get to have that moment of relax a little bit maybe and have that tender moment that doesn't yeah. go against the context really. Yeah, and that's so well said too, because that was, intentional especially in the case of infinity sun where i know that i want to be writing more about the romance stuff but i'm like if i were really in this situation right now i would not be getting hung up on this i literally right. am like trying to stay alive people are hunting me there's like a quest for immortality that like we're racing against the clock here it's like i do not have time to like have a backyard date right now you know <laughs> and you're right but it is those like quiet moments where you're kind of like talking to each other about the war and you're getting to learn more about each other. And, and yeah, there are no backyard dates in Infinity Reaper either, but you know, there is a chapter that I love. It's called Obsidian Night. And it's one of my favorite chapters in the book. And you definitely get to see, I, I basically, I call it my, my whole new world magic carpet ride chapter. That's cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you'll know it when you see it. Now, you've got another book coming out this year, and I was super I excited to see this on your list. Here's to Us, which is the sequel to What If It's Us that you wrote with Becky Albertalli that came out back in yes. 2018. I'm so excited to see more about these two because I just adored yes. them. Any teases you can offer us on what's in store in the sequel? 
it's really gay as any story <laughs> involving Arthur and Ben is going to be. Becky and I are having so much fun with this book and there's some fun like off-Broadway action. There's some fun fantasy book action. There are some really, really cute new boys in it. Things are tricky for Arthur and Ben, but it is the first time they have seen each other since the ending of What If It's Us. So we get to be with them for that moment and it's huge and feels very true to the essence of their story. Like their reunion is very, very fun and oh, special. I can't wait. What was it like to you to flip back to that contemporary space and to flip into co-writing outside the infinity cycle? That either oh felt really God. good or was such a slingshot. <laughs> it was brutal. It was brutal. So it's really interesting because when I was writing Infinity Sun, I was also drafting What If It's Us with Becky like all those years ago. So, and then at one point, like What If It's Us really had momentum. So we just finished that. And then I finished Infinity Sun like after, but then we like edited What If It's Us. I was editing Infinity Sun. It was like a whole thing. And then What If It's Us got published. Infinity Sun was out or about to come out. I, from Infinity Sun, I went straight into the sequel. Infinity Reaper. And I would love to have just done Infinity King. So I could have like done all three books in a row, but I whiplash right back to what if it's us world. And I thought it was going to be really easy. Like I talk with Becky every day and I really kept telling her, like, I can't wait to be writing here's to us because it's just one narrator that I have to write. I get to write half a book and these books aren't as long as my fantasy as Infinity Reaper. And it's been so hard. The voice is so different, you know, to like slip back into it. And it was a really weird process too, because Becky's been writing. We have a, a really like solid outline, but Becky's been ahead of me the entire time. Like she's writing Arthur chapters without my Ben chapters. So like we're finishing Whoa. this draft, like by the end of the month. And then we have to go back and like make everything make sense and, and just gel it together. But it was so different from when we wrote what if it's us like like it it was a strain for us in a lot of ways and we have like found our ways through it but like it's covid hit us also in different ways too you know right. and it really affected our writing schedules like becky writes books a lot faster when her two young boys are in school and i am a very social person who lives alone you know and it's been like really psychologically like hard for me as well and then it's like all these deadlines to like have two books out in one year or whatever it is a privilege that has come with like a lot of stress but yeah I mean we're getting through it it was it's hard I'm very oh god I don't know I'll ever do a series again after Infinity Cycle and what if it's us just because unless I'm able to do them linearly just because it's been hard <laughs> and I was going to ask about that too because those two series are your first series yeah um, so maybe going back to standalone now it sounds like <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I went from having no series to two sequels out within the same year. And it's just like, I'm like, God, I have no idea what to expect for these things. And I'm experiencing it, you know, twice over. But, you know, like I want to return to my Death Cast universe, which was first created and they both die at the end. And the kind of beauty of those books is that like they're, they can all be standalone, you know? So I get to like work in a world that I love writing in but like new characters, so I get to like keep it fresh for myself. And if I take like an extra year to write a book, I'm not leaving you with the Infinity Sun cliffhanger, you know? Right. <laughs> um, and uh, cause that's really important to me. Like I really do respect that relationship between my readers and I want to not keep you guys like waiting longer than you have to, especially for supporting me so early on with the book's life. And I mean, I do my best. Like Infinity Reaper was supposed to come out in January and it's coming out in March because I needed more time. And I went through a lot of mental health stuff and I decided to prioritize that, which is my own sort of like character growth that I didn't have years ago. <laughs> and a better book came from it. You know, I could have, we could have had a book out at the beginning of January. It wouldn't have been as good. And I'm glad that I took the time to produce a book that I am proud is going to be on shelves. And it's good to hear too, that you did take the self-care moment. I mean, 2020 yeah. was crazy and it's good to do what you need to do for yourself which then is good for the end product as well 100 percent. and you know i really really especially through 2020 have such a deeper love for story and engaging with story and the privilege of being entertained by stories and i'm like yeah no i want to make sure that when someone's going through a hard time that like my book can be that escape for them. You know, I want to make sure that that is like just something I continue to honor because 
once the book's out there, it's out there. So I hope it's something that like I'm proud of. Let's talk origin story a little bit. You mentioned before that you you started at eleven. What got you started to pick up the pen? You know, it's funny. So when I was in third grade, we would get these like spelling contracts where, you know, you get your like 10 new vocabulary words, you have to like use them in a sentence and everything. And one week, my mom and I, we decided to make it like Titanic themed. So I created like all these like sentences that were like about like the Titanic, which was like not the assignment. You could literally sentences could be about anything. I did the book cover for it. We did like Titanic, we did it in glitter. I got A plus 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 like on that assignment. My mom still has it like in her closet somewhere. And the entire thing was Titanic theme. And I just love telling stories and just like absorbing stories. And then we had a gigantic computer. And I just found myself like writing myself in like magical situations. And then as I read Harry Potter, writing Harry Potter fan fiction, as I watched Charm, writing Charm fan fiction. X-Men, I remember writing an X-Men storyline in my composition notebook where Jean Grey was pregnant, but the pregnancy was only going to last three months because I didn't want to write about her being pregnant for nine months. So I made it like a psychic magic like pregnancy or whatever, which I guess has been done in many fantasy stories as well. So I mean, I just have always been engaged with like storytelling that way. Even when I wasn't always actively writing, like I've always paid attention to story, like video games. Like people don't understand that like, Video games were big for me when I was like conceiving stories like as a teenager and just like paying attention to story and plot lines. Like I was just as invested in those stories as I, you know, am today with books and TV shows. I love the Titanic story. That is one of the best origin stories I've ever heard <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> Thank you. What video games were inspiring you for story, you know, as a teenager? I loved Fable. Fable was my favorite video game, like in my teen years. It's basically a quest story where the choices you make determine your morality. So you can be good, you can be the bad guy. And my brother is always like the hero. And I was always a fan of like the villains, like growing up. So like I was the one constantly like in the video game, not in real life, like stealing from people's houses and throwing fireballs through people's <laughs> windows and like attacking the townspeople and everything. And like, to the, and then as you, the more and more choices you make, it alters your appearance. So like by the end of the game, I had devil horns, swarms of like insects, just like flying around me and like dark eyes and like, yeah, it was just like powerful. And then, you know, you get to like make like these final choices. And of course it was like, do you donate the, 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 the prize money to the town? Do you save the dog or do you keep the money for yourself? I was like, keep the money for yourself. <laughs> you know, like I was like pure evil and I loved it. And I really, I do love villain stories now. It's partially why it's so fun to write from, you know, some more like shadier perspectives in the infinity cycle. And why one of my favorite fantasy series is the Young Elites by Marie Lu. You know, like I loved Adelina as a narrator because like she makes like dark choices and you, sympathize with her in some ways and then you're like oh you're going too dark like come back come back i was really inspired by that i loved halo i loved gears of war. I, I liked gears of war but yeah i played a lot of video games what led you down to become a ya writer which is what you've written to date so far what was it about that that spoke to you i think it's like a time of my life you know i wrote more happy than not when i my first novel when i was 20 Two. So it was 2012. That was an interesting stage in my life. I was like really processing a lot about coming out. I was processing things that happened in my later teen years and they still felt really close and intimate to me that I was able to like easily find that voice, which is like when I started trying to write my first novel, the very first version of Infinity Sun, which like not the middle grade one, there was a different adult version that like combined some storylines. I won't bore you with the details, but I was writing about like people in their like early 20s when I was. 18, 19. I was like, I didn't know what that was like. And I remember like marriage was like a big plot point for me at 22. Cause like, I, that's what I thought it was like, you know, and for some people it is of course, but like, that was not my reality. You know, I really viewed 22 year olds. Like they could have been 30 in my head for all I knew. Right. Throughout my twenties, I've had a lot to process, especially when you had a closeted like childhood um, and you're an artist is now like expressing yourself in these things. You are now getting to like, let some of these stories like breathe for the first time and like let them out. And I've had so many stories that I've wanted to tell and just like sort through my feelings. But I honestly, I don't 
think I have like, I will probably have like eight or nine YA books. I don't think I have like nine more in me. Like, honestly, mm -hmm. like, I think I will probably tell some more adult novels now that I want to like, kind of like explore things that happened to me in my like mid twenties up until this point. And I want to get into writing some more TV, you know, but I don't think I'm going to be like a YA novelist for the long run. And I have, I'm extremely proud of everything I've done. And I definitely have stories that I'm still really bursting to tell in the YA space, but I would be very surprised if in 10 years, when I turn 40, that I am still publishing young adult novels, like at the rate that I am now, at least. Mm -hmm. And your story is really caught with people, even from the first one. What do you think you're bringing to YA that has made people stand up and take notice? Oh man, I couldn't even... I do not know. And I would feel really arrogant kind of like speaking to that. But, you know, I know that like much like so many other authors, I am just so honest. And I think my books are publishing at a time, especially more happy than not, where there was a call for diversity and within like our fiction um, and within like our writers and everything. And I think I really got to benefit from that in so many ways, you know, because of the work of organizations such as like We Need Diverse Books. And, you know, and like my book came out the same year that We Need Diverse Books got really big and that we were like holding publishers accountable for why are we only publishing cisgendered, heterosexual white writers, you know? I sold my book before I knew that We Need Diverse Books was going to be a thing. This book about a gay Puerto Rican in the South Bronx in an economically challenged family, much like my childhood. And, you know, a lot of publishers did not bite on that. It was widely <laughs> rejected. My first publisher was Soho Teen, which is an imprint of Soho Press. And, you know, like definitely a smaller publisher, but like really powerful and such a great team there. And, you know, I went with an editor who I didn't know, even though I had so many industry contacts, but he was the only one who understood what I, the story I was trying to tell and wasn't trying to make me turn the gay kid straight or the Puerto Rican boy white, you know, and let me tell my story as it was for me. And I really respected that. And, and yeah, and I just, I don't know. I, I think since then I'm one of the more sort of like public facing queer authors and everything I do is queer. I don't have a single novel that is like just <laughs> narrated from a heterosexual pers perspective. And again, that's also a point of privilege of mine, right? Like I didn't have to do that. And I've been out to everyone since I was like 21 or something. So I didn't have to worry about that. And all my stories, like, it's like, look, they're all gonna be queer. I just want to continue contributing to the queer catalog. Like you don't need me writing a straight book. It's just like a, a straight character right now. Right. Yeah. What's a book you've read recently that you would recommend to our listeners? How It All Blew Up by Arvind Amadi. It's incredible. It follows a Muslim Iranian boy who is being detained at the airport. And while doing so, he's being interrogated by the officer and he's telling like this nonlinear story of this like beautiful out of country trip to Rome that he's like just had like where he has like spent the summer and everything like escaping from his like problems from home and it is so gorgeous it's so beautifully paced I want more people reading that book so yeah How It All Blew Up by Arvind Amadi. I'm putting that on my TBR immediately. <laughs> you'll, you'll love it seriously the main character Amir is incredible. Is there anything else you could tease us about coming up? I mean we've talked about that there'll, there'll be a third infinity cycle we know about Here's to Us Anything else you can drop a hint on? I'm hoping to return to the Death Cast universe of They Both Die at the End as like my next work. I also have another standalone novel that I've been kind of like tinkering with. It plays with time in a really fun mm -hmm. way. And that would be like a really, really interesting story for me to tell. Like I, I'm so excited about it. I have a title for it and everything, which of course I can't talk about. So maybe I shouldn't have even said that. That's just annoying. But I think my next thing probably after the Infinity Trilogy is like wrapped up will be something in the They Both Die at the End universe. Fantastic. How can everybody keep up with you online to follow the release of Infinity Reaper and everything else that's coming? 
I keep it really simple. It's just at Adam Silvera, silver with an A at the end. And my website is adamsilvera.com where there's an events page. You can see some of the um, upcoming events for this book, for the Infinity Reaper, as well as everything I have going on for the rest of the year. And yeah, doing a lot of like fun virtual things and chatting with a lot of fun people with like different topics as well for each night. But yeah, and I'm always active on Twitter and Instagram. So that's the absolute best and like fastest way to find me. Fantastic. We'll link to everything we've talked about in the show notes so that everybody can just easily go click to it. Adam, hey. thank you so much. I have so much enjoyed this conversation. So have I. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun. This episode's transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the author interview for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And don't forget, the show notes page also has links to everything that we've talked about in this episode. And you're going to find a lot of links to Libro.fm in this episode, because practically every book we talked about has an audiobook that's available on Libro.fm. You've heard us say it before, we love the Libro.fm service. The fact that you can buy an audiobook from them that also supports a local bookstore of your choice is such a fantastic thing to help out those local bookstores. Now, all you need to do to take advantage is get the free Libro.fm app. It works so good, guys. You're not going to have any issue working with that app. And then you can go to biggayfictionpodcast.com slash Libro.fm, that's L-I-B-R-O-F-M, and you'll be able to sign up for a special offer that they have for our listeners where you'll be able to get a two-month audiobook membership for the price of one. So make sure you check that out. And thanks so much to Adam for coming to talk to us. I love all the details that he had on how much the Infinity Cycle books have changed from the time that he outlined them to actually writing them and even stuffing new chapters in right before the arcs went out. I can't imagine what that was like for his editor to deal with that kind of deadline. And plus, it was great to hear how urban fantasy was really like coming home for him after so many contemporary books. So looking forward to digging into this new book this week. All right, I think that'll do it for this week's show. Coming up next Monday in episode 292, Joshua Ian is here to talk about the new book and his darkly enchanted romance series. That's right. Joshua continues that series on March 8th with the release of Manchester Lake. We'll also talk about the books that he writes under his alter ego, Lawrence I. Hill. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, please stay strong, be safe, and above all else, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big A Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Our original theme music is composed by Daryl Banner. Thank you.